Great. I'm going to go ahead and get this meeting started. I just needed to make sure that everybody understands that this meeting is going to be recorded. So anything you say or write in the chat will actually be recorded, just so that there's a fair warning disclaimer out there. So welcome, everybody. This will be a shortened webinar from what we did a couple of weeks ago on digital badging in the workforce and how we can actually start badging and making that connection between work, workplace skills, our programs, our training. Today we're actually looking at connecting training competencies badges and mapping out the competencies to our programs and courses as well as our non-credit side as well. So we need to figure out what the new normal is in workforce credentials. Our goal today is to gain knowledge of how a digital credentialing system functions, adding value for students, workers, and employers, identifying actionable opportunities for innovations that are currently underway or innovations you actually want to implement, determining the priorities for credential changes that we, we want to set in motion for our business practices. What do we mean by credentials? Credentials is an umbrella term that includes a documented award by a responsible and authorized body that has determined that that individual has achieved specific learning outcomes relative to a given standard. So credential, if you translate it loosely, credential is a standard, applied some kind of value to that credential, measuring standards that those are on there. So employer decision making usually is uh, diplomas, degrees, certificates. Um, professional or industry certifications, apprenticeship certificates, digital badges and other micro-credentials, licenses, new forms likely to be invented. And the problem we're having right now is everything is disjointed. I moved around the country a lot, so I have close to 13 different transcripts from uh, basically 13 different higher educational institutions that all compile what Brenda can do. So they're all disconnected. So when I apply for a new job, I have to get official transcripts from all 13 because we don't have a national database of credentials. We need to establish the relationships between and among credentials, whether they're lateral, lattice, nested, or stacked. And we need to connect those credentials to purposes and value in multiple contexts and connections. I always laugh because I said, you know, when I applied here at the system, I didn't use any of my coding credentials because I was not asked, one of my job functions was not to actually code. So I made sure that I left those off of my resume and any transcripts I have. But that doesn't mean that I'm not a whole person because my coding skills actually provide value to this employer. But it just was not one of the requirements for the job I actually entered the system in. Well, we need to start looking at connecting all of our learners' credentials through their lifelong learning pathways. One of the things that struck me when I started working with employers is Lockheed Martin, they expect to retain an employee for 34 years. But during that 34 years, it, even if they hire them as an engineering technologist or a BS in engineering, they expect that learner, that employee, to learn and gain new skills through the 34 years. And it's a matter of combining internal training, external training, higher ed, industry certifications, professional certifications, make that employee very, very valuable to Lockheed Martin to retain them for 34 years. So we have multiple entry and exit points of a learning pathway, and we need to make sure that we are connecting those different credentials to actually help move them along. One of the things that is coming up nationally, the Department of Labor, Department of Education is really worried about how creating credential silos meaning that if I have a credential from one institution that doesn't transfer to workplace, if I'm exiting that work pathway, or it doesn't enter into another educational pathway as a stackable certificate. And so we need to be careful of that. That's why we need to connect all our credentials, look at what's actually going on, and uh, develop a pathway. Why do we need connected credentials? Right now, the workplace Especially from an employer viewpoint, they're looking at competency, what a person can actually do on the job site, usually based to industry standards, or they're looking at professional standards. And when employers can see details of those experiences and skills and knowledge of an applicant or a worker, it actually helps the hiring and the talent management process by focusing on validated skills and future potential. However, there's a fundamental communication gap where employers aren't sure what credentials they include what the actual credential itself includes, and that students aren't equipped to clearly express their competencies based on their credential. We've seen, by speaking with employers, if somebody asks them, well, what classes did you take? They say, oh, I took MAC 202, I took MAC 201, I took whatever, and they list it. does not give an employer 
any idea of what that student can actually do, that applicant can do, or that actually reskilled worker can do on their shop floor. So we need to be very conscious of the fact that when we talk about credentials, it doesn't have the meat behind it that employers are looking for. The result is that we have a highly fragmented patchwork of credentials that presents major challenges for employers, students, workers, and government funders. Attempting to compare and evaluate the major features and overall quality and value of the different credentials. Because remember, the employers might get a, a resume that has MIT credentials or a CU Boulder credentials or even a Front Range credentials. How are they to determine without an explicit record of what competencies that student can do, which is the best fit for their, their position? And if you go on the other side, if I am an applicant, I want to make sure that my competencies meet with that ex employer is expecting or I set myself up for failure, and we definitely don't want to actually set up our students up for failure. So what's the problem? We definitely have a lack of transparency in our credentials. We need to actually give meaning to mid-career military veterans. We're getting a lot of veterans into our system, and how do we equate what they've done on the job with the military as to learning, and how does it fit into our programs, and how does it fit into the workplace? Dislocated workers, we know that a lot of our welders in 2014 were pulled to the North Dakota oil field with the skill sets that they actually needed, but they never completed their certificate or degree programs within the Colorado Community College system. Now that the oil fields are actually being retrenched and shut off, those, those workers are coming back to Colorado and needing to gain skills or refresh skills or to get some type of credential so that they are valuable inside the Colorado workforce. We also have non-traditional forms of education. We have former college students who need a way to aggregate old credits with new ones, especially in the IT and healthcare fields. And people with degrees and certifications who need to refresh or expand their knowledge or skills. Sometimes we're talking about career switchers, right? So you might have a, a bachelor's degree in engineering, but you decide you want to go into teaching. And how do you bring all those skills together so that it creates a new pathway for you. Why do we need something different? If we look, employers have trouble finding and retaining people with the skills they need. In 1973, only 28 percent of the jobs required a post-secondary education. Projected by 2020, 65 percent of the jobs are going to require some form of post-secondary education. And so with that requirement means a way to actually credential that learning. In a survey of 126 CEOs of major U.S. companies, 97 percent of the respondents cited that skills gaps is a problem for them, and 62 percent reported that there was trouble finding applicants for jobs requiring information technology and advanced computer knowledge. So even if we're preparing our students for a welding degree, we need to ensure that they are building in uh, information technology and uh, advanced computer skills as well so that they can continue on their learning pathway. Why badges? Why now in Colorado? Interestingly enough, in 2013, when we started with the original grants, the Advanced Manufacturing Grant, we had an average shortage of qualified workers of 15,000 per year. So it was 15,000 in 2013, add an additional 15,000 in 2014, 2015, that's a additional 15,000. That's 45,000 open positions that we're having a hard time filling for Colorado's economy as well as our workers. In May 2015, the uh, governor, Governor Hicken, said that he wanted alternative credentials to enter into the post-secondary market, as well as our president, Dr. McKellen, actually said we are going to start digital badging in advanced manufacturing. What we had to do is find a solution which identified competencies that were learner-focused, community-centered, and industry-driven in the form of digital badging. We wanted to ensure that there was transparency of learning. Competencies were very visible to an employer at a granular level. And linking that knowledge to what a badge earner can do, we wanted portability. Those credentials could follow the earner through a lifelong learning pathway, and that the data could be verified and certified by the badge consumer, meaning if an employer actually clicks on one of our badge, they can certify that that is the exact badge that was issued to the exact student with the exact data behind it. What is a digital badge? It's earned through learning, job training, professional development. It's web-based, so you can share it through websites, social media, email, resumes, and it results in increased 
job opportunities, promotions, recognition, certifications, and lifelong learning. The national survey said 38% of the organizations use or plan to use digital badging into the future, and 81% will maintain or increase their use of badges in the future. So that means we've got that gap of what people are doing and planning and what they expect to do in the future. So we know micro-credentials are coming on the horizon, and we need to be prepared for that. The survey of values of digital badging include 45% said it was motivation, 44% say it was a display of achievement, 43% was recognition of specific knowledge and skills such as the math, accounting, teaching, anything like that. 39% said it was a recognition of soft skills like leadership, collaboration, teamwork, some of the 21st century skills that we've been asked by our governor to incorporate into our courses. Perceived concerns of digital badging, we have some, definitely 46% say that they don't even understand or recognize what a digital badge is, so there's a lot of market awareness that we actually have to do. Digital badging is not yet taken seriously. If you present two people, one with a certificate and one with a portfolio of digital badges, both with IBM certification, uh, right now it's kind of like a judgment call on who they're going to be taking seriously. 29% say there's lack of guaranteed ROI or an accurate way of measuring the effectiveness of people who actually have digital badges. But I think with more people adopting it, that is going to change. That was the speed dating of an overall view of digital badges. Does anybody have any questions? I'll wait a bit. Bringing it back to our local level here. Remember, grades and degrees are symbols that we have actually given implicit meaning, that we ascribe the fact that an A equals X. Um, we could have easily, back in the day, said A means you're an absolute failure, and that would have stuck. So we actually have grades, degrees, symbols, formal learning pathways with hard and soft skills, and we just give that meaning. Same thing with digital badges. We have defined roles. There's an issuer, an earner, a viewer, and sometimes we call that viewer a consumer of badges. They're actually taking in that badge and dealing with that badge. There's two emerging archetypes of badges. Aurora Public Schools are doing participatory badges where they can actually show some kind of achievement. There's surface learning going on. It's definitely an extrinsic motivator, similar to everybody on the soccer team gets a trophy or everybody gets a ribbon or everybody gets a gold star day. It tends to work a lot with low ability students. Back in November when we released our white paper on digital badges in the CCCS system, we definitely decided that we were going to do skill-based badges, that we were not going to do participatory badges such as in the gaming industry. We were going to de develop badges that had skill mastery. It actually signifies deep learning. It was an intrinsic motivator, and it's to distinguish those high-ability students. If we look into why badges are valuable, it's because it has a lot of metadata. All the zeros and ones behind that digital image actually make sense. Back in 2011, Mozilla Corporation and MacArthur funded 60 projects across the United States. And part of the project was to actually develop the metadata code, the Open Badge Initiative code, contained all the data for the digital badge blockchain type things, where we can actually, it's built into the code who the issuer is, who's the receiver of that badge or the badge earner, and then where does that badge go from there to create the chain of evidence so that you can always track that back. I like to refer certificates and degrees and transcripts are offline badges because what you see is what you get on that piece of paper. However, with a digital badge, because it's web-based, you can dig into the details. You can get a link to who the issuer is. You get a name that that is issued to, and you can get a link to the evidence. So everything is there for you digitally. We actually have three types of badges that we've started issuing throughout the uh, CCCS system. We're capturing competency in different ways. We're assuring quality because we had a task force for our top right hand badge, which is our manufacturing level one. We had a task force of all the manufacturing colleges in the CHAMP grant as well as Metropolitan State University who actually looked at all the competencies throughout our program decided that they wanted to badge the NIM standards because not all students take the NIMS test, but we know that that has a national standard that's recognized throughout the United States. That's how we actually developed that group. Engineering graphics, we also had a task force that worked approximately eight months looking at our new fields of engineering graphics with uh, Metropolitan State, Red Rocks, Front Range, CCD, Pueblo, Pikes Peak, 
So what we ended up doing is we knew that our students would track up to Metro. They could potentially track their AAS up to Metro. So Metro State University in Denver developed their engineering graphics badges, identified the competencies that they that their businesses and industries were wanting to highlight in their, their certificates and degrees. And we backward designed those competencies into the CCCS badges. So everybody, all of the advanced manufacturing colleges that are doing engineering graphics agreed on the competencies that are represented by these badges. And our very first launch of our badges were the uh, technical math badges that were driven by uh, manufacturers and businesses. We kept saying our students don't know how to do math. Most of them take Math 108. What do you mean they don't know how to do math? That was in context in advanced manufacturing. Uh, employers were saying we need a way to weed out the students who understand math concepts inside advanced manufacturing. We want to identify that. And that's how we got our uh, technical math for industry badge. When we go back to the anatomy of the badge, this is for the Drill Press Skills 1 badge. We have a very big description that says this badge validates that the individual has skills. And it t talks about the different skills. It gives a lot of detail as to the competencies. Not only can they demonstrate safe and proper use of the cutting tool assembly, but they effectively use machining applications of counterboring, countersinking, drilling, reaming, tapping, applying correct operations such as deburring and part loading. Those are very, very specific skill sets that were actually identified by our business advisory groups on if I'm getting somebody from your program, I want to know what they can do. And these are the, these are the competencies that I need on my shop floor. And also, you'll see at the very bottom, there's a link to the NIMS credential site that these were actually based on. So you can click on the link into evidence. And all the students who actually earn this badge have to upload them passing the NIMS certification. And the only way they can get this badge is if we get notification from NIMS itself that that student has actually passed. Everybody talks about the validity of badges. It's very easy to verify what's going on because all badges should be based on the OBI code, which gives us very specific and discrete fields that have to be filled out to be a valid badge. Or based on the same metadata standard, it identifies all the artifacts of the badge, and the display is linked to a unique URL. And common uses for digital badging, 70% are for professional or internal training. And this is where we start thinking about CFEI partners, is that we are actually delivering professional and internal training to those businesses. So this is a perfect avenue of how to actually give them some credential that fits in a longer lifetime of learning or career development. 49% are to indicate a certification. 40% are to recognize some kind of achievement. And then, of course, 40% is for competitive motivation. That does help anyone stand out from a crowd. Story is one of the reasons why I knew that badging would help our students. Back in 1980, I was a geopetroleum engineering student at the University of New Mexico. Spring of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. And my geology instructor canceling classes because I got called up by the USGS. And I'm going to go deal with researching what happened on Mount St. Helens. And he asked for 12 research assistants. I was young and I volunteered. So out of a class of 500, I was one of 12 students who went up for approximately 8 to 12 weeks up on Mount St. Helens. And I did pumice testing, and I did photographs, and I did dome measurements, and I tromped all over Mount St. Helens and everything like that. And I had a great time. As a matter of fact, I still have some ash left from Mount St. Helens that I saved from my time up there. And so when I came back to UNM that fall 1980, I looked at my transcript. I was like, I did this amazing experience. Nobody else in the world, but like me and 12 other students and my professor actually did that. I look at my transcript, and what do I see? I see geology A, geology lab A. And I was just like, oh, OK. I look at all the other 500 students. They also got an A. But they didn't have the same experience as I did. They don't have the field experience of working on one of the continental U US's uh, most explosive volcanoes. So there was no way to document that kind of field experience. And this spring, when Mount St. Helens started rumbling again, had I only had a digital badge that said I was one of 12 people who actually took measurements of the Mount St. Helens in 1980, I probably would be in a different place right now. Because that type of competency, that type of field experience, is very hard to quantify in our current traditional credentialing phase.
So with badges, they help anyone stand out from a crowd. They help employers make distinctions between two candidates that look ideal on paper because they are backed by competencies employers understand. So to start out issuing badges, we actually had to establish an ecosystem. So we established the fact that they are all built on competencies. They all have to be assessed in some way. We actually have to compile the metadata, which actually creates the badge. Then I go do outreach to our businesses and companies and actually tell them, when you're receiving a badge, this is the kind of information you can get. You can access the badge. Let me show you how to access the badges in Credly. Let me show you how to access badges on somebody's resume. Let me show you how to access badges in something like LinkedIn or Facebook. Then view the metadata. Actually look at the metadata that tells you the competencies this badge is based on. You can map those competencies to open job positions, to talent management. To look on how that actually fits. Lockheed Martin, I like using Lockheed Martin because they talk about it for a satellite. They actually move that project team onto a different project. And it's not like you can take that same 10 people and move them to the to a different satellite because that satellite might have different needs for what they're actually building. So in the talent management system, it says, oh, I, I need somebody who does spatial relations in deep space. And I need somebody who can work in, actually understands how metal reacts in different temperatures. And so they can start building more effective teams in their talent management system. And so they actually transcript that credit as into PLA or talent management. They track that information. And badges help them do that much more effectively than just writing down they've had machining 202. As we talked about before, we have uh, workforce targeted badges. Any badge we produce here at the system are definitely tied to workforce skills. We do not really develop an idea for a badge inside CCCS first and then try to push it out, push marketing. What we do is pull marketing. Our employers and our businesses and our advisory groups or the sector summit tell us these are the competencies we need identified so we can start filling our open positions. And we pull those competencies in, we backward design them into where do they fit in our existing programs and how do we make that, that information much more evident and visible to our employers. So we have 23 discrete math skills, everything ranging from basic math through basic finance. What we found in the first runs of our technical math is employers were sending their employees to the technical math MOOC. It was a free MOOC, which is going to start again in October on the canvas.net network. So those employees were coming into the MOOC, and that employer was saying, I need you to know more about geometry so you understand the relationship between volume and solid and angles so that you actually bore a hole in this metal much more precisely. Or I need you to understand ratio proportions and percents so you can figure out whether your geometric dimensioning and tolerance is, is correct. So we had a lot of employers who sent their employees to get reskilled or upskilled and math skills, and then they took the badges back into the employer. And that employer then said, great, you've passed this. I know you actually have a proficiency. We're going to do this with you, or we're going to do that with you. So it was a very nice way to actually work with the employers so that they got exactly what they needed. They identified they had a, a need for a much better educated work in math, and they actually got that. An unintended consequence is when CCA actually looked at our math skills, there are CNA programs. Those applicants are never required to take math, but we know that those applicants are much more successful. They complete the program and are easier to place if their math skills are really strong. Could we have our applicants go through your MOOC, get assessed for a specific uh, ratio proportions and percents, units of measure, and maybe scientific notation? And then when they bring those badges, they actually put those badges on their application. We can float their application to the top of our list because we know that they're going to be successful in the program and they're going to be easier to place. And I was like, sure, we have no problem with that. So that was kind of a nice unintended consequence. What we built for the advanced manufacturing industry is actually being used by other people within the system because it actually fills the need. It actually proves that those two actually have competency. The next set of badges that we did were the machining level one. I mentioned that they are uh, based on the NIMS uh, machining level one credentials. And those were definitely industry driven. Most of our employers are now wanting some kind of national certification whether you're doing CNC turning programming, whether you're doing turning and chucking skills, whether you're doing turning between centers. So when our students who are able to actually badge 
in addition to their programs, our advanced manufacturing employers are looking for these badges. These are the um, engineering graphic badges that I mentioned. The ones on the left are what we developed for Metropolitan State University. And we backward designed those competencies and added more of our, our own CCCS competencies to the ones on the right, which are our CCCS digital badges. So we have all these workforce targeted badges. We have advanced manufacturing, the machining on the left. We have the engineering graphics. We developed through a task force that we ran about nine months for faculty development because we saw a need inside of CCCS that if we have a faculty member who's te teaching at CCD, they want to have the same level of competency or skill when they actually go to front range and teach part time. So we have that as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop right there to see if we have any other questions going on. Again, the speed dating of how badges fit in the larger ecosystem, how they've actually been launched out throughout the CCCS. I was just down at Ike's Peak this week, and one of the conversations we got into was they just started instruction, a high school to a two-year college program. And we're talking about how to identify those skill sets that are not nationally certified, are not locally certified, but that make your students much more marketable for employers down there. And so I think we're going to be working for, on some construction badges between now and March and we'll end up sharing them with a community college. So we'll probably have anybody who has a construction type program get together in a task force and start developing the competencies for those badges. So that's what's coming up and it's kind of exciting. So now we get down to why CFEI is interested in badges. And it's because employers are making decisions with credentials. Spring of 2016, we had nine advanced manufacturing employers. They, they were discontinuing the use of credentials of degree and certificate-based hiring, and they were only going to do competency-based hiring, which required them to rethink how they wrote job descriptions and how they actually advertised for open positions. So there's nine manufacturers in the Denver metro area that when you see their job openings, it's going to be competency-based and not certificate-based. Certificate-based tends to screen out people, but it doesn't tell you who's the most qualified, whereas competency-based actually tells you who's the most qualified. So a Gallup poll found that only 13% of employees engaged at work is sad. However, with digital badging, we know that 65% of the people who have digital badges are much more engaged in their work as well as we believe it's going to grow into the future. Again, we're talking about how digital badges connect employers to job seekers. The employer must have access to a database of badge specialists. And right now, that database can either be the credly.com site, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Um, badge candidates must have visibility into the employment opportunities, figuring out where that is. And that's the skillful.com connection right there. And interesting information, North America has about 51% of the digital badges. Europe and Middle Af uh, East Africa is 19%. Uh, the two heaviest uh, badged areas in the world, Ireland in 2014, redid their whole educational pathway from the Department of their Education to include digital badges in their credentialing system. So if you look at Ireland, primary, secondary, and post-secondary educational pathways Digital badges are embedded in all of those pathways. Also, the Czech Republic, are, they are one of the highest users of digital badges for credentialing in their system. Uh, North America is becoming late to the game, but we're still being one of the major players of digital badges. Current industry badges, Microsoft. You can actually get Microsoft certification digital badges. IBM Open Badges delivered through their open university for their IBM certification. Cisco certification, National Retail Federation is issuing badges. There's an MBA digital badge. Banking is actually doing digital badges. And Child Development Associate, that's a national industry that actually has digital badges for competency. Colorado companies already badging. Interestingly enough, it's the Colorado Department of Transportation. We had a meeting at the state HR professionals, and we were talking about digital badges, the same outreach that we're doing to you today. And they're like, but 
our Colorado Department of Transportation already does badging. I was like, I had no idea. Tell me more. And what we found out was the Colorado Department of Transportation is actively looking at LinkedIn and Facebook for very specific digital badges and competencies that are evident there, recruiting directly off of those sites, prior to posting an open job position. So if, we, if our students are waiting around for Colorado Department of Transportation to post an open position, that means they're like third string, right? That they're not the A team because Colorado Department of Transportation has already sought out Facebook and LinkedIn for credentials. They've looked at their own employees' connections, their network connections, and recruited off of there first. And if they can't find anybody in that pool to hire, then they'll actually post an open position. So that says a whole lot about how we have to ed educate our students about actually creating professional profiles, making sure your cr uh, credentials and certifications are actually active. Hunter Douglas, Home Depot, um, the National Park Service, the U.S. military, there's badges for vets that actually take whatever they've done in the military and they actually translate that into uh, industry recognized badges. Real world example, I already talked about Colorado Department of Transportation. IBM, it started external badging for industry recognized IT skills, um, but they quickly realized that they were missing a huge segment of their own workforce talent. So they, in 2014, they created a professional development internal to IBM to digitally badge uh, skill sets so that they can actually do a much better job of talent management. Microsoft did the exact same thing. Bank of America in 2014 understood that they were going to start hiring by competency. What they did in 2014 to 2015 is they digital badge. They created a professional development year-long series of training. And for all of their HR professionals, they earned or they did not earn, depending on how well they did, and they were assessed with the evidence, digital badges so that when Bank of America in 2016 started actually hiring by competency, the HR professionals had went through the process of training, either earning a badge or being denied a badge, and knew exactly how badges worked at a valid, verified credential. And so they're all now prepared to handle applicants with digital badges. Fossil, which is the watch company, the apparel industry, it was interesting. They started in 2015 creating cohorts of students who were high school and to age 20 to learn design for any kind of design. It was metal design, plastic design, any kind of design that they actually do for their watches and their apparel. And they had a fossil employee as the mentor to a cohort of about 12 students. So through this process, the students are learning design skills for whatever medium they're actually designing. And that fossil employee is actually mentoring them through specific skill sets that they need. Fossil realized this was an awesome way to actually start internally figuring out who was doing really well with this mentoring project. So they also created an actual mentoring badge. So if you are mentoring 12 students and hitting uh, team working skills and teaching people how to do communication and prioritizing and all that kind of stuff. Fossil is then badging their own employees and putting them on a fast track leadership track. So Fossil actually started off with the idea of let's badge students, badging the competencies that we need in our entry level employees, but realized that Mentor was actually providing super um, leadership skills and developing their own professional development and they're actually badging that. So that was a really example of how Fossil took the idea of badges and used it for themselves. What's really super interesting is the impact of digital badges have on social media. As of two weeks ago, I pulled a badge report. So we have 67 badges that we've created for our system. Uh, we've only issued 395. Compared to our pop student population of 145,000 students a year, 395 students is pretty small. However, if you look at the actual badge activity, that means of those 395 badges that were issued, right now I think we're sitting at 22,000 actual clicks. 
Somebody has actually looked at that badge and clicked on it, looked at that badge in a LinkedIn profile and clicked on it. That badge has been tweeted out and it's been clicked on, or it's been in Facebook and somebody's clicked on it. So that tells you the scope is people are actually looking for digital badges to look at the competencies and to see how they fit. So it gets a real big exposure to whatever your program is or tied to whatever your, the training that you're doing. So it does social media and how it is impacted by digital badges is pretty big. Diving deep down into targeted badges, we have our machining level one badges. If we connect the credentials, remember we started the webinar for connecting credentials, it takes front range of manual machining certificate. Through that certificate, students will be able to sit and test for six digital badges. If they then add a CAD CAM certificate to that manual machining certificate, they can then add an additional four badges. So we have, we have paper certificates as well as digital badges within our program. If then they actually go on to get an AAS in precision machining technology, they will have been able to hopefully uh, obtain, sit and test and be assessed for all 11 digital badges that are valued inside the advanced manufacturing companies here in Colorado. They can then take not only that AAS degree, but their 11 badges, go out and get another job, or they can transfer to Metro State's CF and engineering technology. I was over at Metro this spring talking about digital badges and how digital badges will actually track up to Metro. And when I showed them the students who were earning the drill press skills one badge, they were like, can we get their names? Because that is an exact job opening that I have because you've listed those competencies so I know that they can actually do it. So that was an interesting information that they didn't even realize they could actually search for people who had digital pre press skills until I actually showed them the badges. So can badges actually equal jobs? In May, I did a Indeed.com search for advanced manufacturing jobs here in Colorado. There was a lot, but I came up with two, a large and a small firm, right? Barbara Nichols and Department of Treasury. And on the right-hand side, you're going to see the CNC Turning Programming and Operations badge. Uh, we had approximately 13 students from Front Range earned that badge during the spring of 2016. And if you actually look at the highlighted words on the right-hand side of the screen, they do match up with what was actually asked for in the job opening job descriptions on the left-hand side. So it gives the employer a one-to-one -one match on the skill sets as well as it gives that applicant, yes, I can do that, and here's how I can show evidence that I actually have those competencies. Uh, Monument University has an online degree program in business IT. Their regional employer wanted to align curriculum competencies and workplace requirements for new hires and career ladders. And so the questions they asked, which is what you CFEI business advocates will do, is how can badges add value? How can badges represent competencies? What is the learning and assessment processes? And what is evidence of mastery and competence? Because that's a really hard thing for employers to actually talk about, is what, what is the mastery of this competency? How do you know they can actually do it? And when we talk to our faculty, we say, OK, well, how do you know they've mastered that competency? We've taught them that, but that doesn't mean they necessarily have mastered the competency. And who validates it? We know right now we have several different ways of validating the actual competencies. Some of it is industry standard testing. Some of it is project space. Some of it is actually having to design and develop something on their own. And how will the badge actually be evaluated within the system? So there's lots of things to have a conversation about when you're talking about your training programs and how do we fit these alternate credentials into their training program. Use cases, consider with a large firm, they have to anticipate uh, Lockheed Martin again. Um, they can hire a BS in engineering, new, uh, brand new graduate, and they usually hire them at approximately 120000 a year. In that first year, they usually put about uh, $36,000 into training and upskilling and mentoring them through that first year. So by the end of that first year, they have $156,000 invested in that employee. And it's very hard to 
turn loose of a bad fit, if they don't have the competencies, when you've invested $156,000, whereas they could take an AAF student that actually has these badges that tell them their competencies and actually have a much better fit and a much better return on their investment in that employee. Also, what, what kind of training do they need throughout a time frame? Um, can we match the skills and competencies from project to project? And how do we actually identify what competencies are creating churn in an employment place? Building badges into your projects, the things you guys need to know are focusing on training competencies and outcomes. It's not that you're just going to train them for OSHA 10, but what are the competencies are they supposed to get out of this? And how do you actually show that they've actually mastered that competency? Build a connection between non-credit training credentials and the colleges. So we want to create that educational pathway so that they could take non-credit training or professional development and somehow work it into an educational pathway. Because we know if you're going to be employed for 40 some odd years, there is going to be upskilling and uptraining. Talent management, when you're able to actually talk about how badges identify competencies and competencies actually help with talent management within a firm, if you have a really small firm and you only have two employees, most likely you kind of know what both of them do and do really well. But if you have 20 employees or 50 employees or, like us, 5,000 employees, how do you know who has the right competency for the project you're going to start? And remember, because the FEI is a taxpayer-funded training, it also increases the value of taxpayer-funded training because you're identifying the competencies that are needed in the workforce very clearly with a digital badge. And that's pretty much it. I don't have any other slides. Do I have any questions? Debbie, did you have anything you needed us to um, talk about for uh, Pike Peak or Katrina? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, this is Debbie Sagan. So, no, I don't, I don't have any specific questions at this time. This was a really great uh, overview, though. Help, this helped me a lot to understand how the CHAMP curriculum ties into what we are doing with our CFI, CFEI grantees and how uh, the badging might fit for us, too. So I can already think of a couple of employers who might be interested in going down this path. So thank you. Absolutely. And remember, we can also badge other things, like we're willing to go into healthcare, we're willing to go into IT. I know uh, Pike's Peak is actually doing a lot in cybersecurity, and there's one niche skill is having a person who understands new technology and can add backwards program into legacy, such as Fortran. That's a very niche skill, and not all students want to do that. And we don't have a certificate in backwards designing to legacy machines. That's a perfect opportunity to identify a skill set that's needed down in Pueblo, Pike Peak, Colorado Springs, and making sure that your employer say, if you have a student, an applicant that comes in with this badge, you know exactly what they can do because of the competencies we've identified. But thank you very much, Debbie. I'm glad you were on the call. Brenda, this is Yvonne Gilstrap, the um, CFBI manager here in Colorado, and I'm excited that representatives from seven of our colleges have heard your badging presentation and are becoming knowledgeable regarding badging. Hopefully we can communicate to our Colorado First and existing industry companies the importance and the clarity of using badging. The um, CFEI program and the grants provide an opportunity to introduce badging to many companies each year. Usually we're doing about 90 um, CFEI grants per year here in the state. And I wanted to uh, certainly encourage the representatives on our call today to not hesitate to either reach Brenda or myself for information when you have a situation where you'd like to introduce badging to some of our companies for their talent management. I've seen this um, presentation twice now and heard it, and each time, you know, I get excited about it and um, fitting it into the opportunities that we have to work with companies um, should, you know, should not be that difficult. So thanks, Brenda. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Yvonne. And then, yeah, I wanted to actually um, echo what Yvonne is saying. It shouldn't be heavy lifting for you because I know you're not an expert in badges, but I am. So don't hesitate to call Yvonne and say, can you schedule Brenda to come out because I'm having a meeting with one of my companies and I think they might be interested in this. 
I'll be happy to travel the state and actually take up that heavy lifting of explaining what badges are, how they can actually benefit the company as well as your program. Please don't hesitate to call us. If there's no other questions, I will go ahead and turn you guys loose for your early Labor Day holiday.